Welcome to Turn of the Page. I'm Joan Bryden, and each week we'll be exploring the minds of the authors behind the words by bringing you insightful and provocative interviews with many of today's leading authors. Welcome to Turn of the Page. I'm Joan Bryden, your host, and on this edition of Turn of the Page, I'm very excited to say I am speaking with author Sandra Champlain, and she has written her latest book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Thanks, Joan. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I'm really excited, too, because, well, first of all, I get to pick out the authors I want, of course, for the show. I'm excited because I always seem to get great authors that really move me. And I'm sure my audience, maybe they're getting tired of me saying this is a a fabulous book, an exciting book, because I do say that a lot, but I truly mean it. And I have to say, your book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death, not only have I read the book and it's all marked up, but I have a whole journal that I'm, I'm working on right with it. I have been journaling since, I think, page two, and I just want to thank you. This has been a treat. Oh, you're so welcome. That delights me. I just, I never know what happens when somebody either downloads the book or buys it in a bookstore. Some people write emails and things, so it's, it's just nice to hear some feedback. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome. I want to give our our listeners a little bit of information about you. So I'm going to actually read it right from the back of your book. Sandra is the author of How to Survive Grief and the Law of Chocolate. She owns the Kent Coffee and Chocolate Company in Connecticut, travels with the world-class race car teams providing hospitality in the American Le Mans and Grand Am Series, a highly respected speaker, author, and entrepreneur. And Sandra, it says, is committed to making a difference in lives of others. And I truly think you're you're going to and have been doing that with your latest book, We Don't Die. Let's tell everybody a bit about you, Sandra. Let's start with, I love the story in regards to how you ended up working with the Grand Am series and the American Le Mans. It's a neat story. Would you tell our listeners about that? Oh, I sure will, because even when you read the back cover, the, the first thing that came to my mind is people are probably going to think, what does life after death, after death <laughs> happen with being a chef and with chocolate? <laughs> and chocolate, well, yeah. Is, I'm just a normal person like anybody else. And out of my own kind of hidden fears, you know, I, I started this little secret study of life after death. So my day job, I still am a chef for the race car teams. And to answer that question is I went to culinary school. I went to Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, graduated in 87 as a chef. I had big dreams of owning a restaurant someday, which I never did. Um, But I got the opportunity to cook for race car teams in Daytona, Florida. And there's a 24-hour race that happens every year. And the crew guys and the race car drivers have to stay right by the cars in the pits for 24 hours solid. So that means they can't leave for food. And in the old days, they'd be lucky if they got a donut or a hot dog. And so my mom and I started this business that we actually cooked for the teams and delivered the food to the teams during the race. And over the, that, 1987 was our first race. And then over the course of the next 20 something years, now what we have is a giant tent and then, um, you know, there may be a race on a Saturday, but the whole week leading up to that, those cars are practicing and the guys are testing and they're fiddling with the cars and things. So we cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner the whole week before and then for the race. So we've cooked for people like Tom Cruise when he used to race cars, Paul Newman, Craig T. Nelson, who played coach on TV. Right now I cook uh, for Patrick Dempsey and Dr. McDreamy from Grey's Anatomy. Oh, wow. And there's, there's all kinds of neat people, just really down to earth and... Um, the teams win. I think we we you know, feed the belly good food, it's like feeding the soul. It, it does something for performance. So I also get to spend a lot of time with my mom, which I love. You wrote about the fact that how exciting that has been, but there was always something a little bit, I don't want to use the word missing, but something that was still needed. And I wanted to ask you, you said in, in your book that you had a fear of dying. And I just wondered, I didn't quite understand from reading your book, where did that come from? And it sounds like it's a fear that so many people do have. So many people have. In fact, after I wrote We Don't Die, I've done several book signings, Barnes and Nobles, and local bookstores. And it's a very secret thing. People are just come up to me, oh, my gosh, I've had the same fear. 
And it's not something we talk about a lot, but even right now, there's two or three books at the top of the New York Times bestseller list about life after death. So it's something people are feeling. They're feeling fear. They lose their loved one. And that, when we have this question of what else is there. And for me, to go back to 96 when it all kind of culminated and then was the real panic of what lies beyond my grandfather had died several years before my dad had been diagnosed with cancer, although he lived from that episode. I had pets die. I was very busy in life. And, and then there's these times, and I'm sure you and your listeners have felt it, when you are outside, maybe coming home, and you look up at the stars, and there is in front of us infinity, right? And then this question of, well, what is it all about? And I think, Joan, at the time, I was going through a heartache of being broken up with by a boyfriend and just unhappy. And so just turning to, well, who am I? What is my life for? Does my life have a purpose? What happens next? What, and, then, and then it really hit, like, what does happen next? And I didn't have an answer for that. And I didn't know, you know, there's something about li- if. You know, this is I find out after the fact, now that I wholeheartedly believe in life after death. But without the fear of dying, like there's, there hasn't been a fear, fear of living for me. So I've been able to, to not fear dying, it's to not fear living. And there's been so many opportunities that I've had to work through my fear and go for things I normally wouldn't have done or say things I normally wouldn't have done and taken risks, I mean safe risks, but I have new results and I have an incredible life now. And so, yes, I know the book's about, you know, starts off my skeptic's discovery about life after death, but it's really a handbook for living so that I don't want people to fear living and I want people to have rich, fulfilled lives. And that's the true message. And of course, there's lots of information in it. Oh, you have underlined right now. (laughs) (laughs) The whole book is underlined. (laughs) But I was just going to say is that when we first came on, I said to you that I've got a journal that I'm I'm doing at the same time. Mm -hmm. I went out and and picked up just a notebook, and I've been, you give assignments throughout the book to do. (laughs) And uh, so I have to tell you, you're one of the first that got me to do it immediately. (laughs) I I, I don't know. Immediately, I thought, well, I better do this. She says you have to act on it immediately. And I have been doing that. And I have to tell you, by the time I got up, I think to about chapter five or six, I started making calls that I had been putting off that I was a fear of rejection of being rejected mm-hmm. things like that I started it just sort of like it just took over me and I want to say that nothing else had changed in my life other than I picked up a copy of your book we don't die and I don't know how to explain it it's really interesting because all of a sudden I I didn't have which I didn't even realize I did have a fear of living I was fearing making a a few phone calls. I was, you know, I I felt fearful about a number of things. And it's sort of like I just went through a checklist and just started doing it. By the time I got to about, I think it was a fourth, fifth, sixth chapter in your book. And as a result, how do you feel? I didn't realize that I must have feared living. But now to think about the book and you give so many facts on that there is a life after death. For some reason, I just felt like, well, hey, it's not over tomorrow or the next day. You got more to do here. No. There's a purpose here. Find out what your purpose is. Go after it. You know, sort of like it just felt really freeing. I want to introduce your listeners. I know you've read it in the book. to mm-hmm. something called The Voice. The Voice. Oh, uh, yeah. The Voice. Yeah. Because even when you said you have assignments in your book, Mm-hmm. The voice in my head said, oh, my God, nobody's going to want this book because there's homework mm-hmm. to do. Nobody likes to do homework. <laughs> we all have this voice in our head that consistently, constantly is talking to us. And if we don't think we have it, all you need to do is try to try to quiet your mind for a second. And immediately it'll say something like, well, what voice? Do I have a voice? <laughs> and this voice is something that all human beings share. And it, it's always trying to look out for it, its survival. So is it good? Is it bad? Am I pretty enough? I need to lose weight. Is this true? Is this false? And the voice comes from the different things that have happened in our past. So as we grow up, our parents might give us messages, and whatever that is, it becomes the truth. 
my first boyfriend, broke up with me for my very best friend, and so something clicked, and my little voice said, I'm not good enough. And, you know, things like that. So the reason I wanted to bring that up now is because it's very easy, and my little voice always said, life after death isn't real. People that believe in mediums and psychics, not possible. I mean, as the truth, and even the best example I can have of people believing the voice is for centuries people believed that the earth was flat. And, of course, it's round, and Magellan circumnavigated the globe in his ship, proving it was round. And for 300 years, even after that, people believed it was so flat. They just wouldn't believe it. And so what I come up with first off normally when I talk to somebody is like, well, you proved to me that it's real. You proved to me. And the first thing I need to do is say we each have this voice, and the voice is dictating what's true and what's false. And so when we can each acknowledge that, that voice may not be us because would we ever, ever, ever really tell ourselves we're not good enough, we're too fat, or give us a fear of picking up the phone and calling someone we love? No, that's not us. That's this voice. So while you're with us for this hour, I just ask everybody, including myself, because when the voice ch chimes in, it's just to say, oh, well, that's just the voice. Set it aside. Listen, because there may very well be something new for yourself in your life that can prove great results. Again, I am speaking to author Sandra Champlain, and she has written her most latest book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. I want to first say thank you to Sandra for being on Turn of the Page. I think it's a very important book. I think all of our listeners, you will be so excited. I want to send you to Sandra's website as well, so you can kind of get a taste of it, and uh, we certainly want you to pick up a copy of We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. So Sandra, first of well, why don't you tell us where your book is available? Sure, it's wherever your favorite bookstore is. Some people love Amazon, some Barnes & Noble, some barnesandnoble.com, or your local bookstore. And if you would like an autographed copy from me, of course you can do that. And I have also some really great free information on my website. And that you can just go to wedontdie.com. Between the quotes and all the different websites, authors, you give such a great list as of people that... If you're interested in the subject matter of is there life after death, this is a great resource. But I had to say I was a little nervous about reading your book because I've always felt that, you know, when someone passes, just let it be. Let them continue on their path. I've always felt there was different planes, but I, I didn't ever think it was all right to contact them. And I wondered if you would tell me your thoughts about that. I always felt that if somebody has passed, they are, you know, going to be peaceful and at rest. And why would we want to call them back into our lives and speak with them? Well, I think, first of all, there's no resting when we pass, I think. <laughs> I, I really believe when our eyes close this final time here on planet Earth and where they open up, and I, I can tell you, you where I think heaven is as well but there is just this place of all beauty grandeur so many people who have had near-death experiences even blind people that have never had vision in their human life have had near-death experiences and have literally opened eyes and been able to see colors and things and where we wake up in is well I'll put it this way have you ever had a dream so real and then you wake up, and it's like, oh, wow, that was so real, but this, it was just a dream. Well, when we pass, it makes our life right now seem like it was just a dream. There's more vibrant colors. There's all of our loved ones are there. It's just, it's great. And I personally believe that there's more education to be done, that we review how this life went. I believe our life now is an education for our soul that heaven is a place that's all good and all wonderful. But, of course, you, you need to have, I hate to say this, but the bad to be able to experience the good. I was just driving from my mom's house before we got on this interview, and I imagined if, you know, cheesecake is one of my favorite things. <laughs> but if all I had was cheesecake, mm -hmm. like that's it, mm -hmm. how special would it be? <laughs> yeah. And so it may be a poor comparison to heaven, but to have good all the time, you can't really feel the good. So we come to this place called Earth, and we get five senses that we have, and 
Um, we get to live a delicious life, and I know there's heartaches. I, I know because I've experienced a lot, too. But this is where we grow. This is where we have the emotions and everything. So when we pass, I do believe there's more education. I don't believe at all that we're at rest. And so in the big scheme of things, if you don't mind me telling my story about when I saw Doreen Virtue, to know that sure. it, it was big to connect with the hereafter. And now... <laughs> There's a funny book called Do I think it's called Do Dead People Watch Me in the Shower? <laughs> because does it mean now if our loved ones are around that they're always around? And no, rest assured, heaven, the hereafter, there's more lessons to be learned. There's things happening. But in times of sadness or in times that you need some strength, they're only a thought away and can be by your side and consoling you and things like that. So when I, I was a skeptic, in fact, I was such a skeptic, I'd go into a bookstore and see these sections that were spirituality and the occult and all that, and I just laughed. I thought, oh, these poor people that believed in that stuff, you know, they should really have a life, get a life. And I had seen Doreen Virtue do a performance somewhere in New York, and Joan, there was something to it, because although my skeptical mind thought people she was giving the medium readings to were somehow plants in the audience. I couldn't figure out why, because she wasn't trying to sell us on anything. She wasn't trying to sell her book. book. She wasn't trying to sell us a program. She was just generously giving messages of love, and specific ones. Your grandmother's with you. She taught you how to knit. Your favorite soup was her homemade tomato soup she used to make when you were a kid, you know, like real specific. And people would just cry. So very discreetly, I flew to Laguna Beach, California, and I took a weekend course with Doreen and about 20 other people. And I was so scared. Talk about fear, because it's like, I, and I'm now dabbling into something I don't believe, but then, you know, what if it is real? And she rested our minds right in the beginning. She said, it's just, it's okay to con connect with your loved ones. It's, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. They may not always be available because they have other things going on, but when they are, they're only a thought away. So she said, I would like to start off with, we're not really going to do a medium reading now, but I'm going to show you how it's done. So everybody grab a partner. And so I took this woman's hands and sat knee to knee, and she says, okay, hold hands, close your eyes. And she says, again, this is just practice. If we're not really doing it. So no need to be afraid. She says, I want you to imagine your hearts are connecting with the visible energy, like light energy. And, then she, and it's a very safe space. And she says, quiet the mind. And if people get nothing else from this interview, quiet the mind. And she said, invent a person standing behind the person you're with. And just use pure imagination, tell a story. If you see what they look like or what their name is, you just tell a story. So I went first because I'm very creative, being a chef, and I just started telling my my new friend the story. I said, well, I'm seeing a man behind you. Again, Joan, I'm inventing this. He's, her, the, um, he, is your, he is your grandfather. He's your mom's father. His name is Jan. He worked on a fishing boat in Denmark. Because on my mind, I see a flash of a boat, and I don't know what, where Denmark came in, but I said it, and he's got a big gap between his two front teeth. I said he died of lung cancer, and there's a message that he wants you to give your mom, which was something along the lines of having never said I love you while he was alive. And so I opened my eyes, and it's like, okay, your turn. And my partner just had some streams of tears going down her face because, indeed, her grandfather's name was Jan, he was a fisherman in Denmark. He had the big gap between his, his front teeth. He died of lung cancer. And he never did tell the mom that I love you before he passed. So that opened the door wide up to, okay. <laughs> and, and it gives me goosebumps just saying it because it's so hard even for my voice in my head to believe that it's all real. But very real, very real, very safe. Only messages that I've ever gotten are messages of love or there's some funny things, um, but, but it is safe. Mm -hmm. And 
I think a lot of the scary stuff that we see in the movies or there's all kinds of ghost hunter shows and things like sure, that. Sure. And I, 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 I don't want any of them to come after me by me saying this, but I think they sell <laughs> TV shows and things yeah. um, because the, the real hardcore people that have been involved in mm-hmm. life after death and um, communication with the hereafter, it, it's good stuff that comes through. Well, and I think that has a lot to do with who we are as individuals, too. That That's the yes. the bringing in the, the light as opposed to looking for that which might some people would call evil. Right. So much, again, about your book, although the title is We Don't Die, A, Skept- a Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. What you certainly make clear through the whole book is that we're not who we think we are. And uh, I actually printed that up, and I have that on my uh, on my mirror. Uh, and it's sort of to it's sort of to make me be more mindful of of the moment and, and not listen to the voice, but listen to the soul self. In your book, you mention so much about a way to contact our deceased loved ones, uh, electronic voice phenomena, which I just happened to be up in the middle of the night, uh, I don't know, a week or so ago, and was going through channels, and that's what they were doing, is they were showing an example of that. Well, it about scared me, <laughs> to, scared me to death in the middle of the night, so I thought, well, I'm going to make a note of that. And then it was uh, soon after that that I received your book. And, and, uh, and I talk about it. <laughs> yeah, and you talk about it, so, you know, synchronicity, I'm sure. But I would would like you to talk about your experience with electronic voice phenomena. Uh, sure. I After I took Doreen's course, I realized that I was only right 30, 40% of the time being able to accurately tell people who their deceased loved ones were. And I'm somebody that I want people to like me. So I didn't want to tell anybody I took the course for fear they'd say, well, who do you see around me, Sandra? <laughs> and then I got it wrong. And then I, you know, then they'd sure. laugh at me. So basically I didn't, I didn't tell anybody any of this. Um, it was actually, we'll get to this a little bit mm-hmm. later, but it was actually the death of my dad that had me mm-hmm. finally say, I need to put what I know on loudspeaker and write a book. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that. But I went many, many, many years. I think it was like eight years before I told anybody what I was up to. But one of the things was I found out about electronic voice phenomena. It sounds crazy that we can use a tape recorder and record the sound of nothing or there's some background noise like a fan blowing or water coming out of a shower or something like that. But that when you play it back, there'll be voices that appear. And I had been, I had seen a woman named Reverend Rita Berkowitz, who's, this is a good reference for your listeners as well. There's a church called Spiritualism, Spiritualist Churches. And even Abraham Lincoln was the spiritualist. And it's not any new age thing, but it's Christian based. However, at the end of the service, the minister will come out and say who the deceased loved ones are around the parishioners. And so I had found one of these churches in Massachusetts where I live, and the minister, Rita, is not only the minister, she's also an artist, and she takes private clients and does medium readings, but she also draws pictures of who is around the people that she's doing the readings for, and that's just mind-blowing. She's the spiritartist.com is where she is those pictures and then she had some guest ministers come in the next week and I had gone to the service and the husband gets up the wife did the service and the husband gets up and he says you know I never could buy into any of this he says I have a very scientific mind and if I can't see it or hear it I'm not going to believe it as far as life after death Mm -hmm. well he got involved with this electronic voice phenomenon and he said and the movie White Noise had just come out and he says and it, it really scared some people because that's what they were doing in the movie. Of course, it was a horror movie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I have not watched it. No, thank you. I don't like scary movies. Um, but he said basically it's using a recorder. And he said he and his wife put a tape recorder in a, a bedroom, their bedroom. They left the house for 20 minutes, and it was just recording the sound of a fan. And he said when... He came back and he played the re- what was on the recorder. It sent chills for him. And so he actually played the recording. And both he and his wife had lost children, had children pass away in previous marriages. And on the recording, Joan, it said um, there was, like, laughter. And then it very clear, this is very clear, 
there's laughter. And then I said, Daddy, don't be scared. We're still here with you. And that moment gave me goosebumps, as it does right now. But it had me saying, okay, I can't always prove from what my the pictures in my mind who deceased loved ones were, but if I could tape record something and people could hear it, then they would believe me. So I, I took off for a weekend to uh, Rhinebeck, New York, to a retreat center, and spent the weekend with um, a couple that had written a book about electronic voice phenomena who have been practicing it now for 20-something years. And we tried to do these recordings. We, there's a, there's just a three, it was a Friday night, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday. And then the Friday night, we learned the whole art of electronic voice phenomena, how everybody, even the bodies that we inhabit right now, we're all made up of energy. And so when we pass away, our energy still exists. So even if you can imagine... Um, a piece of wood, and it, it burns. Okay, so the, the, bur- the log now turns to heat. It's, now, it's still a form of energy, although the log is gone. Or a puddle of water um, evaporates, and that it just changes form, but the energy is still there. So our deceased loved ones can take the energy of sound that is in our these little... Uh, recorders, tape recorders, and then they can alter the sound using energy. I don't know how, but it's done, and that's how these voices appear on the tape recorder. And so I was convinced over the course of the weekend that it was real, but I couldn't hear it myself. I could not produce a recording that actually said anything. And the explanation was is we have to really train your ear for it because your ear wants to hear if there's a shower running. I mean, it just pays attention to the water. But it's really like if the water wasn't there, is there something else um, being said? And so Tom and Lisa Butler, who taught the course, they kept hearing in my recordings accurate things about people in my life. They knew my mother's name, my grandmother's name, um, all kinds of stuff. And so I knew that they could hear it, but I couldn't. And on the Saturday night of the class, I went to bed by in a little cabin. I had a roommate who was out for the night, and I had my tape recorder, and I was really trying to be a good girl and do the homework and try to get one of these EVPs. And so the only thing that I could pick up for background noise was the sound of water, and it was pouring rain outside. I mean, it was miserably pouring. And so I held out my little tape recorder yet again, and I envisioned my grandmother and my grandfather and my aunt and my uncle at the foot of the bed, and I said, this pretty bluntly, if you guys are still here, and this is real, and I'm supposed to help people, I said, I need you to try to talk loud because I can't hear anything. And of course, Joan, I'm thinking I'm talking to myself. And so I said, I'm going to let this record for a minute, and then I'm going to say goodnight. And so I let it record. And I put my headphones into the play, you know, a hole in the um, little voice recorder, and I pressed play. And normally, what we had done in class is we put all of our recordings into a computer so we could really boost up the sound and play it again and again and again. And I didn't have that. I just had my headphones. And so I was listening, and there I am saying, okay, if you guys are really here, I need you to talk loud, and I'm listening. And then all I hear is raindrops. And then when the counter went to number 46, all of a sudden I got goosebumps because there were some words. And the words just simply said in a man's voice, good night, Sandra. And then two women whispered, good night, good night. And then there was a fourth male's voice that said, good night. And it, Joan, real, (laughs) Uh, there it was. I'd like to tell you I was excited to get my first EVP, but suddenly it brought it into the realm of, oh, my gosh, are people always here with me? Are they really (laughs) here? Is this just some invisible veil? I can't see. What is it all about? But here's what happened. I brought that recording into class the next day, and my classmates were all someone who had either lost a child or lost a spouse or really had some severe grief of someone they had lost. And in that moment, when they heard the recording I got, 
It's like they knew that their loved one was not gone. And so healing began to occur. I'm speaking today with author Sandra Champlain who has written a wonderful book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And as promised, I had asked if you would read from Chapter 4, What the World's Greatest Minds Say. So if you would if you would do that, I would love it. Sure. Okay. About 10 days ago, I retired very late. I had been waiting for important dispatches from the front. I could not have been in bed very long when I fell into a slumber. I was very weary. I soon began to dream. There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. Then I heard subdued sobs, as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left my bed and wandered downstairs. There the silence was broken by the same pitiful sobbing, but the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room. No living person was in sight but the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. It was light in all the rooms. Every object was familiar to me. But where were all the people who were grieving as if their hearts would break? I was puzzled and alarmed. What could be the meaning of all of this? Determined to find the cause of a state of things so mysterious and so shocking, I kept on until I arrived at the East Room which I entered. There I met with a sickening surprise. Before me was a catafalque on which rested a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments. Around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards. And there was a throng of people, some gazing mournfully upon the corpse, whose face was covered, others weeping pitifully. Who is dead in the White House? I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. Then came a loud burst of grief from the crowd, which awoke me from my dream, Abe Lincoln. So in (laughs) fact, President Lincoln saw his own assassination in a dream. And indeed, after he died, that casket was placed in the East Room, and there were stations um, soldiers that were stationed there to act as guards. I was going to ask you for maybe some of our listeners who are saying, okay, this is what this person believes, but religion, what about religion? And am I looking for trouble or calling the devil into my life by doing this? Would you address that? Because you did a lot of sure. research again through so many different religions too, which is in the book. <laughs> I wanted ultimately to create a book that would get rid of the myth that we die. I wanted a book, and this this might be a little strategic, and I'm going to be upfront and honest with everybody. When my dad died, there was a huge amount of pain caused by grief, and I found out some things about grief that help people ease pain. It's actually prevented people from taking their own life, help families stay together. And so there is a chapter inside We Don't Die that, oh gosh, everybody deals with grief. And it, and it helps them through it. And then I wanted a book so that when people are here living life, that we have a great life. We hear so many stories that when we die or just before death, everybody's got all these regrets. And what would it be like to not have regrets? Well, I said it before, but I really wanted a handbook for being human to have, you know, live life to its fullest. And one of the biggest fears I had was I didn't want it to be a religious book because I would cut out the people that were not religious, but I did not, uh, there's, there's a lot of books out there that I've read that really are on borderline, very strange and out there, and even myself, I thought, gosh, people are going to think this is devil's work, it's, you know, oh, trying to c- connect with the deceased and things like that. So what I decided to do is uh, study the top 10 relig- biggest religions in the world, and what I found is every single one of them believes in life after death. There's prayers, there's angels, there's, um, I I went to Catholic school and Catholic mass, and we're talking about our deceased loved ones being seated with God and Jesus and, and things like that. So it rested my mind that I can powerfully 
share this without offending anyone. And uh, what is Chapter 5 is Religious Agreement for Life After Death. And some of us don't even know clearly exactly what our churches believe about life after death. And so that's why I wanted to include it, because we're not doing anything wrong. We're not doing anything against your religion um, by having this conversation. In fact, it supports what you believe in your church. As well as if you don't have a religion, you mentioned quite a few atheists as well in the book and how they were skeptic as well. Yeah, I have a really sweet story that just happened. Is I cook for the race teams, and there's a gentleman that was underneath the tent. <laughs> I, I have a book display underneath the food tent, which is very funny, with a big sign that says, Is there life after death? Sandra <laughs> Champlain says yes. Well, this man... He works with one of the race teams. He's the cameraman. He he does all the videos of the race cars going around. Well, he never even said anything to me, but he bought the book on his own, not even from me because he was an atheist. He didn't believe in any of this. But he bought it from Amazon because he was so curious. He was like, what could be in there that that would convince me that this is real? Well, he not only read the book, suddenly he's got a whole belief. He's got spirituality. He's got power in his life. He feels like he's at the driver's seat of his life. He's woken up to the magic of life, the miracle of life. Albert Einstein once said we can look at life that everything's a miracle or nothing is a miracle. Well, suddenly, you know, this man started feeling his spirituality, believing everything's a miracle, and he flew to my house a couple months ago, and he's an Emmy Award-winning uh, photographer, and he, he has filmed a documentary about me that is, uh, he's, he's like a little kid with new toys talking about uh, the remote viewing, um, oh, which we haven't even gotten into. One of the things I wanted to let readers know how to do is something called remote viewing. It's an ESP technique. And once you do it, you can have a magazine right in front of you, Joan, that you've never even opened. And you can quiet your mind. All of a sudden, images will come to your mind and have a notebook with you, a piece of paper. And you start jotting down some of these random flashes of pictures that come through your mind. And then when you go through the magazine, those pictures that you saw in your head first are actually in the magazine. It is such a mind-blowing experience, but I wanted to give that because it's proof that there's so much more to us than meets the eye. Yeah. So... And he was an atheist, now not. And not that I'm trying to sway anybody from being what they are, it's fine, but anything is possible. This earth was once just a piece of grass and earth and water and trees and rock, and somehow or another, now all of a sudden we have iPhones, televisions, and we're connect- you and I are connecting and we're not face-to-face. And it's all, I mean, life really is miraculous when you think of what we've created with just almost out of nothing. You know, I don't want to be remiss in not mentioning the foreword of your book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death, was written by somebody I think everybody would know and um, certainly respect, and that's Dr. Bernie Siegel. You mentioned in the book, too, I think you were around 14 when your dad was diagnosed with cancer, and they gave him, I think, just a few months to live, and yet he lived, was it 30 more years he lived? and he 30 more years. He gave all the credit to the work that he did with Dr. Bernie Siegel, and it all starts in the mind. And this is magical, too, is um, yesterday I got to be on Bernie Siegel's radio show, and even though he wrote the foreword, all the communication I've had with him has been through email. And so yesterday I got to talk to him for the the very first time, and not not only be interviewed about my book, We Don't Die, but I got to thank him, because what he provides, for so many people, and he provided for my dad, not only gave dad 30 years of life, but it made me to the person into the person I am. I guess there's so much of me that's because of my dad and my mom, too. She's wonderful. But I would have never had that. And so it would, what a loving, wonderful, giving man. And he just likes to be called Bernie. <laughs> well, I thought that was fascinating and everything you've, you've written about him in the book and the fact that, you know, he, he helped keep your father alive another 30 years. Speaking of family, you had quite a bit, when you were going through so much grief, there was quite a bit of issues 
because of grieving with your siblings, and I wondered how that is today. Well, if I can be honest, things have improved, but they're not great. And on one hand, I'd like to say that, you know, I've written this book, so I should have all the answers in my life be perfect. And on the other hand, my family represents millions and millions of families that have come apart with the death of a, a loved one. And when we grieve, we all expect that there's going to be pain and it's going to hurt. And we can all expect that there's going to be sadness. But with also with grief comes, like, severe depression, comes lots of feelings of guilt, comes a poor memory, comes lots of fights in arguments between some of the people we're closest with. And what what actually had me write the book and say, um, I, I need people to know about this, and I don't care if people think I'm weirdo for believing life after death, but I found out that when we grieve, our brain chemistry changes, and we actually lose some of the chemicals that are naturally in our brain, and they drop from 100% to maybe about 10%. And these chemicals not only control how we feel, and that's the reason for the depression and the sadness and everything, but these chemicals also impact our frame of mind. So, for instance, our memory stinks most often when we're grieving. It just there's not enough, like I said, of these chemicals for our proper functioning. And then here's the big key that I found as far as arguments um, with your loved ones is our view of reality is altered while we're grieving. The brain is not correctly storing 100% of the time how we see the world. You know, we hear this a lot of times if there's a car accident and two people witness it, they'll have different stories. And that's just normal, healthy minds. Well, a grieving mind, the two stories could be so far separate and so different and and unfortunately, we're living in our own skin, so we believe our version is the truth. So it explains for a lot of miscommunications and arguments because we're not, we never even really saw the same thing. And so in my family, that's what happened. And I do believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that it will resolve itself. But I also know there's been several thousand people who have read We Don't Die, and I have received hundreds and hundreds of emails about how it impacted their life, how um, even in Green Bay, Wisconsin, this girl woman had read the book before her dad died and made her siblings read it. And so they, they, and they used to fight even when they had healthy minds, but they got through the death of the father and separating the belongings, like knowing what grief is, what, what's automatically going to happen. And, and so they followed the tools, and they actually stayed, got even closer. And so for me, myself, and I, I believe that I'm, I'd like to say a messenger, or I'm, I, you know, I believe in God, and I got this message because I have a big mouth, and I'm a hard worker, and I'm, I can get it to everybody. And so if everything was hunky-dory in my family, and I don't know this is the truth, but this, this actually empowers me. If everything was hunky-dory, I don't think I would have such a burning passion to get it into as many hands as possible. And so I keep seeing, and this might be like the guy who wrote the Titan before the Titanic, but I keep having this vision of being on the Dr. Phil show talking about grief, talking about life after death, talking about empowering lives, and Dr. Phil asking me, you know, well, how is it with your family? And me saying, well, you know, I think we were the martyrs and, you know, we gave up our relationships in order for other people to be healed. And then Dr. Phil says, Sandra, I have a surprise for you. And Joe you know, and they all come walking out of the show. And it may sound corny, but... You know, I really believe, you know, I can, we can look at life being a victim and our life stinks, or we can actually choose to be responsible, and that puts us back in the driver's seat. And I, I don't have the answer, but I do know I have had so many miracles, so much magic, so much healing for myself and others that I cannot believe that this situation won't resolve itself as well. 
Well, Sandra, I hate to say it, but we're about out of time, and I want to no. <laughs> I want to remind everyone that the title of the book again is "We Don't Die: A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death." This book is so full of so much research that Sandra has done, and it just gives you all the. I think it gives you all the answers you could possibly want right now, and then it's up to you to create your own life and to look into all of this. Sandra, again, thank you so much. It was such a delight, and uh, I will look for you on Dr. Phil, but I have a feeling you're going to be on even bigger shows than that. So, <laughs> Thank you. And thanks to your listeners, too, for being with us. And I just challenge everybody, to just, if there's something you're afraid to do, fear is an illusion. Just take, take one step towards your dream. Terrific. Just one. All right, and if you want to hear more about Turn of the Page, just go to turnofthepage.co, C-O. You'll see who's coming up each week, as well as you can listen to this show or any past shows that have been on in the past year. So with that, thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week.